Hate speech is a curious little thing. It starts out with well intentions. There are groups in our society who are especially vulnerable to vilifying speech, pictures, and language. Anti-Semitism, for example, singles out an identifiable group, being the Jews. Should we allow anti-Semitic language in our society? Absolutely. Now, Canada has hate speech laws which are laid out in the Canadian Criminal Code under Section 319. These laws intend to prevent hate speech and to give legal recourse to the government should anyone engage in hate speech. The statute reads for 319 subsection 1, everyone who, by communicating statements in any public place, incites hatred against any identifiable group where such incitement is likely to lead to a breach of the peace. And subsection 2, for willful promotion of hatred, as everyone who, by communicating statements other than in private conversation, willfully promotes hatred against any identifiable group. There are no clear distinctions here, however, that lay out the absolute grounds for hate speech. The bar is set by previous precedent. In an exceptional essay titled The Coddling of the American Mind in this month's Atlantic, Greg Lukianoff of the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education and Jonathan Haidt, a social psychologist at NYU, write on the topic of emotional reasoning. Dr. David Burns defines emotional reasoning as assuming that your negative emotions necessarily reflect the way things really are. I feel it, therefore it must be true. But, of course, subjective feelings are not always trustworthy guides. Unrestrained, they can cause people to lash out at others who have done nothing wrong. Emotional reasoning dominates many campus debates and discussions. A claim that someone's words are offensive is not just an expression of one's own subjective feeling of offendedness. It is rather a public charge that the speaker has done something objectively wrong. It is a demand that the speaker apologize or be punished by some authority for committing an offense. Without clear guides, there are groups out there who aim to use Canada's hate speech law as a cudgel against those they deem to be problematic. One such fellow targeted in this manner is Roosh V. The internet's most famous prick, uh, pickup artist, is on a world tour which includes two stops in Canada. Prior to his arrival in Canada, a petition was started to prevent him from entering Canada. How inviting from the friendly Canadians. CBC Montreal invited on student activist Fanny Gadawa and constitutional lawyer Matthew Bouchard to discuss Rushvi's views on women and the possible violation of Canadian hate speech laws. Gadawa is as expected for a student activist, aloof, dogmatic, and wholly reliant on the core canon of words of feminism, including oppressive, triggering, and problematic. Here she is on CBC Radio talking about Rush V. How would you describe him? Um, well, <laughs> I think I would start by saying that um, the content that he is promoting and distributing on his website or on his online platforms are very um, oppressive and triggering to some. And um, I would I would even go um, as far as saying that it's not only oppressive to women, but it's oppressive to um, anyone who doesn't identify as um, cisgendered or heterosexual. And it's even reduc um, reductive to um, cisgendered men who are straight, um, and it, it reduces them to uh, almost caveman-like behaviors, right? Somehow, the views held by Rush V do not count as oppressive to straight white men. Rush V himself is not white, but that's beside the point. The central concern for feminist is Rush V's proposal that rape be made legal on private property. From his Rush V blog titled How to Stop Rape, he attempts to argue that Without daddy government to protect her, a girl would absolutely not enter a private room with a man she doesn't know or trust unless she's absolutely sure she is ready to sleep with him. Thankfully, Mr. Bouchard is given the opportunity to speak on the important issue. Does what Rush V said in regards to legalizing rape on private property count as hate speech against women? Hate speech is... Um... It's, it's something that's been defined by the court as a particularly, um, particularly special 
uh, way of vilifying someone, uh, you need uh, you need a, uh, a group, a specific group of people. Uh, it has to be targeted at them, and then it has to cause a it has objectively speaking, it has to cause a risk to that group of people. So it's hard for me now taking a few of his speeches who are. Um, I'm not going to comment on the contents, but uh, we, we, we can all agree they're fairly offensive, but simple offense is not enough. You have to go beyond that. You have to objectively put the group who's targeted at risk of some form of either more hate speech or violence. And, and, and do you think you could at least put forward or put together a, a, an argument, possibly a good argument here, that he has singled out a group of people, a rather large group of people, uh, women, um, and that he is advocating that what we now classify as rape criminally should be allowed at home? Well, and that's that's where that's the distinction, I guess. I, I mean, there's certainly an argument to be made, but arguing for a change in the law, because that's what basically he's putting forward, and arguing that women should be allowed, or arguing that women should be raped under the current circumstances, would be a defense for him. I mean, I, I, again, I, I feel horrible saying this and trying to draw fine lines, uh, because I'm, obviously I think this is absolutely offensive. But that is where. The courts have said even the worst form of speech is a form of speech, and there is freedom of speech in this society. So you have to have something which says not only I want to change the law, he has to say I want this to happen to women tomorrow morning. Pivotal in Mr. Bouchard's statement is the focus on the difference between arguing for a change in the law and advocating a criminal act. In other words, Mr. Bouchard is delineating between Rushvi's statement of wanting rape legalized on private property and Rushvi actively calling for women to be raped. As long as Rushvi doesn't advocate for women being raped, then he is not engaged in incitement against an identifiable group. The petition failed in its original goal, as Rushvi was able to enter Canada. Either those who were aware of Rushvi coming did not realize it was Rushvi at the border, or the claim that Rushvi was, quote, coming to Canada specifically for the purposes of violating Section 319 of the Canadian Criminal Code was considered invalid. The petition also claims men's rights activists and pickup artists are hate groups, as deemed by the Southern Poverty Law Center. Here's the SPLC's Mark Potuk on The David Pakman Show. It's a pleasure to welcome back to the program Mark Potok, senior fellow at the Southern Poverty Law Center and editor in chief of their intelligence report. Mark, we've been talking a lot lately about uh, men's rights activism and uh, sort of concurrently, although they do distinguish themselves, the anti feminist movement in the United States and Canada. And back in the spring of 2012, the intelligence report from the SPLC put out sort of a statement about some groups within the men's rights activism sphere that you guys are watching. But correct me if I'm wrong, you did not designate them as hate groups. That's true. There was a lot of confusion at the time. Uh, simply, we wrote an article that was very critical uh, of many of the websites and the people behind them in the so-called manosphere, uh, these men's rights organization. But we did not uh, list any of them as hate groups, and we have it to this day. One note on the SPLC. For all of its work during the American Civil Rights Movement, it's been left floundering in a progressive landscape without the big targets of the 60s and 70s. As such, the SPLC has become more sensitive in seeking out new targets and less discriminate in vetting them. The systematic decline of the SPLC has resulted in it being removed as one of the FBI's hate crime partners. News link in the description. That should speak loudly enough, even for those who are not listening. Now, Rushvi has already conducted his uh, lecture in Montreal and is now getting ready for a stop in Toronto. Interesting to note here is a line from Section 319 of the Canadian Criminal Code, where such incitement is likely to lead to a breach of the peace. Now, feminists, in their attempt to prevent the free speech of others they so rabidly claim to be hateful, seem to be the greatest violators of this concept. Warren Farrell, a noted men's rights activist, had his lecture disrupted by feminists. Oh, <laughs> 
uncommon for these groups to engage in these sorts of behaviors. It is speech they deem to be offensive. Therefore, it is objectively wrong, according to their emotional reasoning. Not wanting to break from the flock, feminists also subjected Rushvi to the non-rational dialogue of radical feminism. Oh yeah! You fucking You're a piece of shit! You're a piece of shit! You're enjoying your time in Montreal! You're a piece of shit! How dare you fucking come to Canada? How dare you fucking come to Montreal? You think you're going to go? Stay away! Stay away! This is fucking Bruce B. This is the guy that says rape should be legal. This guy thinks he should rape your sister. This is fucking Bruce B. He thinks rape should be legal. Fuck this guy. Get the fuck out of here. Get the fuck out of here. Get the fuck out of here. You piece of shit. You're not welcome in this state. Fucking scum. Get the fuck out of here. Stunning how Rouge V merely existing allows other people to throw their incredibly expensive beer away. Again, this is Canada where draft beer is pointlessly expensive. We can commend their dedication, or their numbers. Rouge V relies on a bodyguard to keep the crazy away. Given the opportunity, there probably could have been a lynching, all in the name of preventing offensive speech. Rouge V, of course, knows how to get under people's skin. He celebrates his victory of being able to speak in Montreal by tweeting out 40,000 plus Canadians couldn't stop a lecture attended by only 34 men, even with media and government help. Stunning humiliation. Toronto Mayor John Tory wants venues to cancel on Rouge V, despite no evidence that Rouge V is promoting hatred of any group. It's a sickening mix of pandering, paranoia, and political clout. This is the consequence of absurd and subjective limits on free speech. Feminists, in their sensorial ways, do not want to debate or discuss. They want to silence and control. The aim is to dominate the conversation by being louder and shaming anyone who slightly opposes them. Emotional reasoning leaves them certain of their victimhood and volatile in their hypersensitivity of perceived threats. Why hate speech laws, then? What is the purpose of having enshrined in our culture freedom of speech only to have a law which can limit it? 
Mr. Bouchard stated that Canadian courts accept the most vile of speech is still speech and is protected, which means someone like Rouge V can speak openly in Canada. To a more philosophical end, what good does having hate speech laws do? In an excellent speech by Christopher Hitchens on Canada's hate speech laws, Hitchens argues that censoring speech harms us more than it helps us. Here's Hitchens summarizing the works of Mill, Payne, and Milton. In which it is variously said, I'll, I'll, I'll be very daring and summarize all three of these great gentlemen of the great tradition of especially English liberty um, in one go. What they say is, it's not just the right of the person who speaks to be heard. It is the right of everyone in the audience to listen and to hear. And every time you silence somebody, you make yourself a prisoner of your own action because you deny yourself the right to hear something. In other words, your own right to hear and be exposed is as much involved in all these cases as is the right of the other to voice his or her view. This is not like conjecture on the matter of freedom of speech. Rather, it is core to the most basic rights as human beings. When proposing hate speech laws, we must be willing to abdicate our responsibility in determining what we find offensive or hateful to ourselves, to choose someone else who can tell us what we find offensive in speech, picture, and writing. I do not know of anyone who could do that for me, and I'm certain the likes of Ms. Gadawa and the petition writer Mrs. Parker Tolson do not have a nominee either. If they do, then we must become extremely suspicious of their motives, just as we should all be suspect of the motives of those who are determined to be offended. Interestingly, the sorts of people who claim Rouge V is a misogynist and advocates harm and violence against women are the very people who view women as weak, scared, dependent, and fragile. That women are unable to decide for themselves safe situations and are always at the whim of the men around them. That women cannot choose how many drinks to consume. And that women are too vulnerable to hear speech which may be deemed offensive. The irony here is as comedic as it is tragic. Yet these are the same people who believe they possess the moral authority to tell others what is appropriate to say and what is not. As for myself, I'm not a fan of Rushvi. His approach to improvement is rooted in short-term hedonic acts rather than a lifelong improvement of self, known as eudaimonia. For that, more men would benefit from reading the Art of Manliness blog than listening to Rush V. But it's the fact that we can hear his stupid ideas and judge for ourselves that has allowed me to come to that conclusion. This is my first produced video, so a big thank you for watching. Links to everything seen in this video are in the description. I strongly encourage everyone to read The Coddling of the American Mind by Lukianoff and Hate, as well as That's Not Funny by Caitlin Flanagan. Those links are also in the description.